Hours after Israel declares independence as a nation, it enters its first war against four powerful armies. Being rapidly overrun, the Israelis seek to assemble their own air force, and in a strange turn of events, Israel would purchase what were essentially BF-109s. These aircraft would help save the nation. From 1935 to 1945, aircraft development reached new levels of innovation. The ingenuity brought about by the threat of war resulted in major breakthroughs for aircraft design. Design principles changed, engines and avionics were improved, and everything became a lot faster. During this period, many famous aircraft entered the scene. The American P-51 Mustang, the British Spitfire and Hurricane, the Japanese Zero. But one aircraft would stand out among its contemporaries. That aircraft was the Messerschmitt BF-109. With somewhere around 20,000 air-to-air victories, the BF-109 is by far the most deadly aircraft to ever take to the skies. While the BF-109 would become an icon of German aircraft design during the war, no one would have guessed that a few years later, the aircraft would return to fight in its final large-scale engagement. Not for Germany, but for Israel. By the start of the Second World War, the 109 had seen massive improvements and would see success both in Europe and in North Africa. As the war progressed, the aircraft continued to be overhauled. Among the most iconic and capable variants were the BF-109E4 used in the Battle of Britain and later the G6, G10, G14 and the most deadly variant of them all, the K4, which was still one of the most deadly fighters in the air by the end of the war. Over the course of its life, the BF-109 would achieve roughly 20,000 air-to-air kills. For comparison, the second highest scoring aircraft produced, the Fokker Wolf FW-190, achieved only half the number of victories. The 109 was also the most produced fighter aircraft of all time, with over 34,000 rolling off the production line. The number of aerial victories, verified by gun camera footage, demonstrated the effectiveness of the 109. This wasn't mere Luftwaffe propaganda, and the Allies knew it. There would have certainly been a psychological effect on those preparing to face this new fighter. What set the BF-109 apart from its contemporary fighters, save the Spitfire, was the fact that the basic design managed to always stay relevant. From the Spanish Civil War in 1936 till the end of World War II in 1945, engineers, both in the factories and in the field, were continually overhauling the airframe with new features, new engines, guns and avionics, keeping it on par with whatever was being thrown at it. A true testament to the strength of Willy Messerschmitt's original design. In 1948, Israel would enter into its first large-scale conflict, often referred to simply as the First Arab-Israeli War. A number of surrounding Arab nations declared war on Israel, hoping to reclaim the territory which was now under Israeli rule. In contrast to the large and established Arab militaries, Israel's forces were small and untested. Most who signed up to fight for Israel were new to the country, Jewish immigrants from other nations who had moved following World War II. They would be mixed in with a smaller percentage of Middle Eastern Jews, Bedouin, Circassian, Druze, and other people who had already been living in the region for generations and had chosen to stay and fight on behalf of Israel. Ultimately, despite the continued stream of new manpower entering the country, things did not look good for Israel. The Arab neighbors were united against Israel and their combined forces could strike from almost any direction. The response was to arm up in any way possible. Near the top of the list of essentials for Israel was the need for fighter aircraft. And in a strange sequence of events, the Israelis would end up purchasing what were essentially BF-109s from Czechoslovakia. Following the Second World War, Czechoslovakia acquired what schematics it could on the Messerschmitt BF-109 in order to manufacture them once again this time for the Czech Air Force. Drawing upon whatever manufacturing information could be found, the Czechs settled on what was essentially a BF-109G series fighter. This aircraft would become known as the Avia S-199. Avia had been responsible for the production of some BF-109G variants during World War II, which were often dubbed S-99. However, these aircraft relied on parts coming in from Germany, including the Daimler-Benz DB605 engine. 
The last of these engines were lost shortly after the war, when the last remaining stockpile was destroyed in a warehouse explosion. Instead, Heinkel HE-111 bomber engines would be used, known as the Junkers Jumo 211F, complete with the same bomber propellers. In contrast to the Daimler-Benz engine, the bomber engine had slower responsiveness and far more torque, making the aircraft unpredictable in handling and dangerous. Thus, due to limitations in manufacturing ability and a general lack of experienced German personnel after the war, the later Avia variant of the BF-109 was not nearly as reliable as the Messerschmitt it evolved from and suffered many drawbacks due to a troubled production process. This would earn it a reputation of being dangerous by those who would pilot the aircraft. Nevertheless, the aircraft still functioned and could put up a good fight. The first four aircraft would arrive from Czechoslovakia five days after hostilities commenced, landing in Israel disassembled on May 20th. These four aircraft would make up Israel's first fighter squadron, 101 Squadron. The first combat operation would come on May 29th. In a last-ditch effort, the under-equipped Israelis had blown up the bridges which led to Tel Aviv that same day, hoping to slow the Egyptian advance. However, within hours, Egyptian forces had rebuilt the bridges and were rapidly moving forward. That evening, 101 Squadron would head out on its first combat mission. The task was to slow the massive advancing enemy columns. However, all four aircraft were suffering problems. The guns had not been tested and the radios were problematic and pilots had little idea how to navigate the terrain. It was only thanks to the massive size of the Egyptian forces were the pilots able to identify their target. Coming in, one by one, the four aircraft released pairs of bombs and strafed the enemy column before all of the guns jammed. They were forced to return to base, losing South African pilot Eddie Cohen to ground fire in the process. Then, another aircraft piloted by Israeli Modi Alon would crash on landing. Logistically, it was far from a successful mission. However, because the aircraft had been kept top secret, the attack caught the Egyptian forces off guard and resulted in some degree of panic. They had no idea the Israelis possessed aircraft, nor did they know just how many they had. Israeli radio operators intercepted enemy transmissions, hearing that the Egyptians were calling off the advance towards Tel Aviv. Inexplicably, the four pilots had managed to single-handedly repel the massive force. The next day, the two working aircraft took off again, piloted by Modi Alon and an American, Milt Rubenfeld, this time to attack a column of Iraqi and Jordanian armor. Once again, the ground forces were caught off guard. Rubenfeld's aircraft took heavy damage and he bailed out over the ocean. A few days later, as evening set in, a flight of two bomber-modified C-47s were spotted heading towards Tel Aviv. Down to one working aircraft, Modi Alon took off alone to confront the Egyptian aircraft. In a well-remembered display, the first bomber went up in flames over the city, followed closely by the second. Alon had managed to destroy both. However, the Avia still had to prove itself against the superior Arab fighters, which included Spitfires flown by the Egyptians. The time would come, just a few days after Alon's victory, when newly arrived pilot Gideon Lichtman found himself in a fight with a Spitfire. With only half an hour flying time, Lichtman later said in an interview that he couldn't even remember where the arming switch was for the guns. After flicking a bunch of switches on, he got the guns working and managed to line up the enemy Spitfire. Opening fire, Lichtman managed to down the aircraft in what would become the first combat victory for the Avia. Over the following weeks, several pilots would go missing while on combat missions. The day after one such incident, South African Sid Cohen was flying in search of the lost aircraft. While returning to base after failing to find anything, he test-fired the guns on his aircraft, testing his theory that a gun problem could have resulted in the other aircraft being downed. Feeling something strange after firing, he landed and inspected the aircraft. The synchronizer on the guns had malfunctioned and his propeller had bullet holes in it. Cohen then believed that the missing pilots had shot off their own propellers. Not only that, Servicing problems meant that it was rare to have more than four aircraft operational at any time, meaning the Israeli force was incredibly small. But the aircraft were constantly crashing on the runways, resulting in the few aircraft which were in flying condition having to undergo regular repairs. However, despite its many drawbacks, the makeshift design of the Avia continued to hold back hostile forces in the air and on the ground. 
this small group of roughly five aircraft managed to hold off many incoming bombing attacks and kill superior aircraft, including Egyptian Spitfires. By the end of the war, the Avia would become an icon of the Israeli Air Force. An aircraft riddled with problems, yet proven deadly in the sky against the enemies of Israel. The surprise appearance of the aircraft had compelled the Egyptians, attempting to take Tel Aviv, to turn back. It almost certainly turned the tide of the war on its very first mission. The survival of Israel during this 1948 battle is a testament to both the skill of the pilots and of Willy Messerschmitt's deadly 1935 design of the 109.